Hey guys, this is Sergey, and you're watching the Accepting the Code. Today I want to show you how the knowledge from episode 1 about variable lifetime tracking was helpful for me and my team during one incident that happened when I worked on Build Excel a few years ago. Build Excel is a next-gen build system, and a typical build has multiple stages. First, we need to parse all the files. Then, we need to figure out what's in scope based on conditions like environment variable, debug release mode, etc. Then, we evaluate a build graph to find what we are going to do exactly. And finally, we run the compilers and other tools to produce the build results. In reality, it's way more complex. But here's the key thing. Each stage produces some artifacts used by the next stage. And those artifacts are no longer needed after that. For large builds, these stages take quite a bit of time and are very resource intensive. Here's a simplified version of the code just to illustrate the problem. The first stage is we need to parse all the files. Let's say that it generates 1 GB of memory and takes 10 seconds. Then we compute the build graph. In this case, it will take 5 seconds and the build graph itself is very, very small. Then we mimic a GC collect because technically the project files are no longer needed after, the, after this stage. And then we evaluate the build graph to find what we are going to execute. And then the final stage we are going to run the compilers. Let's use JetBrains.memory to investigate the memory footprint of the application. Currently, the target framework is not Net472. Let's run this under the profiler to see the impact. So we have multiple stages. The first stage allocated 1 GB of memory. That's expected. The total memory footprint is 1 GB. Once that stage is done, that memory was collected, and the second stage allocated again 1 GB of memory, and the total memory footprint never exceeded 1 GB. That's expected. Good. OK, now let's switch to .NET 9. Let's do compile and use the same tool to see what's going to happen in this case. Let's run the .NET 9 version. So the first stage allocated the same 1 GB of memory. That's expected. And now once it's done, we can see that the second stage allocated extra 1 GB of memory. But it seems like the data from the first stage are not being collected by the GC. So let's investigate why. Let's investigate the memory issue in Visual Studio. We can run the code. We'll speed this up a little bit to get to the final state. We can see the same memory problem in Visual Studio as well. We can take a memory snapshot. It will take some time to generate it because it's two gigabyte of uh, objects. Now we can open that. And if we sort by inclusive size, we can see that both project files and evaluation result instances are still being alive and referenced from a local variable. So let's look at the code once again to understand why this is happening. But why? We should be able to rely on the variable lifetime tracking and the GC info. Just a quick recap. The JIT compiler informs the GC when the last time a local variable is used and can be collected. So you don't need to set it to null to make it eligible for GC. And it seems like this behavior has changed between full framework and .NET 9. Once we saw this with our team, we were thinking that we hit a bug in the GC. So we reached out to the CLR team asking them to investigate this case. But actually, this is not a bug. This behavior is absolutely by design. And to understand this behavior, we need to better understand tier compilation and its impact for async methods. To run a method, the JIT compiler needs to translate the intermediate language into the machine code. And this process should be fast, but it takes time to generate highly optimal code, so you can get it all. You can solve this by using NGEN or ahead of time compilation, but this is definitely a topic for another episodes. And to solve this problem, the JIT team introduced a feature called tiered compilation. When the method is compiled the first time with tier 0, the JIT produces code quickly with just a few optimizations. And if a method is called repeatedly, like thousands of times, the JIT compiles this again in tier 1 with more optimizations, like precise variable lifetime tracking. In our case, the build method is called only once, so when the tier compilation is enabled, it stayed in tier 0 without any fancy optimizations. As a result, the lifetime of project files is not tracked, and it stays alive for the entire duration of the method. In episode 1, I showed how to force all the optimizations but using method impl aggressive optimization attribute. But this is not going to work with async methods, because the attribute is applied to async method itself, but the code that we want to have all the optimizations actually sits in a generated state machine, and we don't control the code generation, so we cannot put any attributes here. 
so this is not an option. Another option is to disable tiered compilation altogether, but this is not an option as well, because tiered compilation is a very nice feature that we want to rely on. Another option is to extract this code into a helper method and not rely on any compiler optimizations at all. But we can do even better. If we really want to make sure that the project files are being collected by the GC during the next phases of the build, we can use the following trick. We can pass this local variable into a static quick reference, and then once this stage of the build is done, we can force the GC collect, and once the GC is done, we can check if quick reference is alive or not. And if it's not alive, we can throw an exception. So we can write the test that is going to behave exactly the same way in both debug and release mode, because we are not relying on any optimization that JIT compiler can do. Variable lifetime tracking and the GC info is an internal detail we should never rely on. In our case, we did rely on such optimization without realizing it. And once we migrated from .NET 3.1 to .NET 6, we faced this memory leak. And in reality, it was just a mix of tiered compilation and async methods that affected the reachability of local variables. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit that like button, subscribe, and let me know in the comments below what .NET topic you want me to cover next. That's it for today, guys. Thanks for watching, be curious, and see you next time.